Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, we'll say uh, good morning to everybody. My name is uh, Rob Macedo, and for those that we have that are amateur radio operators, my amateur radio call sign is KD1CY, and I'll be giving this morning's uh, virtual Skywarn class to uh, everyone in attendance. I'm glad to see a great turnout. I know we've had some beautiful weather that people want to get out there to enjoy. Uh, we should be done in approximately two hours or so. And I know at least here in uh, South Coastal Mass, we have some uh, cloud cover, but <clears throat> that should clear out as we go through the day. So hopefully we'll finish the class in time for the sun to come out and everybody can enjoy uh, the rest of their uh, weekend, including uh, Mother's Day and Happy Mother's Day to those that are uh, uh, out there. Um, so we'll have uh, about an hour or so of class time. We'll have a short break and then we'll have another hour for the second part of the uh, presentation. And then at the uh, end of the class, uh, there will be a link to the online quiz um, that people can take. And when they pass the quiz, they will get their spotter ID. This is how we've done the virtual classes since we were all virtual during COVID. Um, for those that are that want to know, um, we have done both live and virtual classes. And with the live classes, uh, people have just gotten their cards on site because we kind of do a, a bit of a review and quiz uh, at the end that at a live class is more interactive. So. Um, just wanted to go through uh, uh, those few uh, logistics here, and uh, we'll put the uh, presentation in the show mode and get started. Um, Bryce Williams is the uh, NWS Boston Norton Skywarn Program Lead, and uh, himself and Glenn Field, who is our Warning Coordination Meteorologist and also an amateur radio operator, KB1GHX, are the ones that put together uh, this uh, uh, presentation uh, today. And so we'll uh, uh, go through it here. and. Uh, Hope people uh, enjoy the class and become uh, spotters. So the National Weather Service is kind of weather behind the scenes. Um, so obviously everybody gets a lot of information off TV, off the internet, radio, newspapers, uh, cell phones, and a lot of the information, particularly the weather models, a lot of the Doppler radar data, except for some of the TV stations that have their their own and, and some private um, a uh, private radar company has been putting in some radars in, in parts of the country. Much of the radar, certainly all the satellite data and the weather model data comes from uh, the National Weather Service and, and NOAA. Uh, so that is uh, the background. That's the weather behind the scenes part of the weather service. And uh, the National Weather Service has 122 weather forecast offices that issue local forecasts and warnings. There are national centers for environmental prediction that include model simulations, climate and seasonal outlooks, aviation and marine forecasts, storm and tornado prediction, and, and, and as well as um, the National Hurricane Center for hurricane tracks and, and tropical storm and hurricane watches and warnings. There are river forecasts that the Weather Service issues and they kind of work with um, the river forecast centers where the Northeast River Forecast Center is co-located with our National Weather Service office. And then there's observations. We talked about the radar, the satellites, they still do weather balloons. There's the ground level observations uh, at airports, aircraft, lightning network, etc. And then it comes down to volunteer data, daily data collectors, which include both co-op observers and uh, the COCORAS uh, program. And then the Skywarn program of volunteer storm spotters focused on storm situations uh, and severe weather of all hazards. So what is the National Weather Service? It's a federal government agency. It's part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. It's part of NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And I'd be remiss if not putting in some of the jokes that the uh, Weather Service forecasters use. NOAA can stand for a couple of other things. It can stand for the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. It can also stand for no organization at all. So some of the jokes from the uh, forecasters that especially our, our warning coordination meteorologists would expect me to deliver. Um, the directive is protection of life and property, timely weather and river forecasts, and there's nationwide coverage with 122 local forecast offices and 11 national prediction centers. You can see our office covers all of Massachusetts except for Berkshire County, all of Rhode Island, and Hartford, Tallinn, and Wyndham counties of Northern Connecticut. 
Um, you can see here the Albany office covers into Berkshire County, Mass, and Litchfield County, Connecticut. Uh, and Connecticut is actually covered by three different weather service offices, uh, the National Weather Service in Brookhaven, Upton, uh, New York. Uh, that's the New York City office, um, the Albany office, and the Norton office. And the reason for that is how the Doppler radar covers these given areas, how well it reaches into the area um, for the appropriate uh, warnings uh, during severe weather events. You can see that different weather service forecast offices can cover parts of states, or, 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 or parts of multiple states. It just depends, again, on that radar coverage. Um, uh, at one point, Southern New Hampshire was a part of our office. Uh, they went over to the Gray Main office in late 2014 at the request of the New Hampshire Office of Emergency Management. Um, so that's some background around the coverage areas and how they're organized. A typical weather service forecast office, there's 26 employees, the meteorologists, the electronics uh, technicians, uh, administrative support. Um, it's staffed 24 by 7, 365 days a year, and the duties are observations, forecasts, all the watches and warnings, and co-located with the Northeast River Forecast Center. Um, so you can see some of the pictures here of the uh, uh, weather service office. Um, and we do have our amateur radio station that is co-located with the National Weather Service Forecast Office. It had been pretty silent because of uh, COVID. Um, our WCM is an amateur operator, and he did have it on for a couple of uh, Skyward Recognition Day events over the last couple of years. We are now uh, able to get back into the office during um, uh, certain um, uh, levels of severe weather and, and can be kind of any, any hazards. So we are going to be back into the office a bit more as we go through this year, severe weather uh, session uh, uh, activations uh, and Skyward activations permitting. So why are you here? So we need eyes on the ground because one third of warning decisions are based on reports. And there are times where the radar beam can overshoot the core of the storm. Um, and when that happens, you can't see everything that is going on. And that may mean uh, the potential for um, severe weather that gets missed. So. The only way to tell those things, despite all of the evolutions in technology, is through ground truth, is through actual spotters on the ground. Um, an example here, and I'll, uh, I'll mute this uh, video. Um, on July 23rd, 2015, a tornado briefly touched down just north of Mount Wachusett in Massachusetts. No tornado warning was issued, and we did have some spotters. They saw some rotation, but nothing really that looked all that significant. But we later saw this video that showed um, uh, rotation and eventually found some damage on the ground, and that's what was a survey team was deployed that confirmed an EF0 tornado. This was June 23rd, 2015. There was a second tornado on this day that was in Rentham, Massachusetts, and we actually had a lot of ground truth um, from uh, wall cloud to funnel cloud to actual touchdown in the uh, Rentham Mass area. Um, so that was June 23rd, uh, 2015. Um, so what is Skywarn? It is all of you. The civilian volunteers trained by the Weather Service report specific weather conditions to the Weather Service. Wind gusts, hail size, rainfall, cloud formations can be average citizens, can be amateur radio operators. There is a partnership between the American Radio Relay League, which is the National Association of Amateur Radio, and the National Weather Service. So there's a special partnership there, but you don't have to be an amateur radio operator uh, to be involved in Skywarn. And in our amateur radio community, we try to work very closely with those that aren't amateur radio operators from a uh, weather spotting perspective. And the common bond is interest in weather and helping public safety. So. Now we're going to show a video, and we'll see if the audio uh, comes through here um, it, to, to show what we do not want our, our spotters uh, doing. So uh, we'll, we'll play that uh, uh, video now here. So 
That is definitely what we don't want spotters to be doing. You know, ask yourself, did you did you actually see a tornado in this video? No, you didn't. Now, there's definitely strong winds. That tree was bending over pretty good. If the winds get stronger or last long, long enough, it could down that tree. Those that There's definitely torrential rainfall and, and low visibility. If that rainfall continues, it could cause flooding. But there's nothing here that's really caught, that's, that, is reportable yet and there certainly isn't a tornado uh, occurring uh, uh, in this video so these are the the things that you uh, 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 you know we want folks to spot and, and report per a criteria that we won't even talk about to the second part of the program but and report what they see not what they think or, or want to see uh, so those are the uh, the key messages there uh, the average annual number of tornadoes per state, you can see here in Massachusetts and Connecticut, it's uh, um, two um, uh, per year. Rhode Island is zero, but it's a very small state. And, and this is talking again about an annual average. It's a smaller state, so it's likely um, under one because they certainly have had a number of, of tornadoes. And you can see um, the averages up in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And certainly you can see the numbers in the plains and in this Dixie Alley corridor area, um, those are the areas that get the uh, most annual uh, tornadoes on a, uh, uh, a per annu annual and per state basis. When you take a look, a more closer look at southern New England, you will see that certainly the higher numbers of tornadoes are out in, in the interior of Massachusetts, um, northern Connecticut. And the numbers drop off as you get into Rhode Island and southeast Massachusetts. Well, why is that? Because generally speaking, we'll, we'll get south and southeast winds at the surface with west and northwest winds aloft. And that's what gets the turning going in the atmosphere. But oftentimes, especially in the early spring, when you're in these maritime areas here, you will have cooler water temperatures. And that sometimes brings in the lower clouds. And, and cooler uh, surface temperatures, which lowers the instability levels. And so that kind of mitigates um, tornado risk when you have the right environment for rotation. But it's not zero. You can see there are numbers here for Rhode Island and Southeast Mass, just less so uh, for, uh, when you compare to uh, as you go west and north um, uh, across um, southern New England. You'll also notice here there's seven tornadoes on the Cape and four of them have been in the last um, uh, uh, four years or so. Three on July 23rd, 2019, and that was an example where the ocean temperatures were so warm, they just were not a mitigating influence when um, conditions were ripe for tornadic activity, and uh, the Cape was hit with three tornadoes on that one day. And then the other uh, tornado was a nocturnal tornado related to the remnants of Ida. So. As you can see, it really depends, you know, if these water temperatures are warmer, then that, that influence um, uh, wane, uh, to mitigate wanes. And especially as you get towards July and August, when the water temperatures uh, between July, August, and then probably I would say even into parts of September, at least the first half of September, are much warmer. And then you lose that influence of the, of the cooler uh, waters. So um, just gives you some idea on uh, reported uh, tornadoes. 2022 was the quietest severe weather season that I can recall in the last 20 years. I go back to 2003 as a year that was a, a relative quiet year for severe weather. Um, there was one tornado in Connecticut and that was in Litchfield County, Connecticut, so not in our coverage area. We had no tornadoes in our coverage area uh, in 2022 and I think you have to go back a lot of years um, where we had literally zero tornadoes in our in our coverage area, probably might be as far back as 2003, or certainly sometime I think in the 2000 to uh, 2010 um, time frame. Um, so it was a really light year for severe weather. Um, these reports represent the first report that verifies a severe thunderstorm warning or the first report that occurred when no warning was issued. We tend to get a bunch of other reports as the warning is issued. These are kind of the initial, you know, kind of first reports that occur um, when a warning is issued or if no warning is issued and the event is missed. So the numbers are a little bit higher than this, but not that much higher. And, and like I said, a very light severe weather year last year. We'll see how 
this year, um, it turns out. Um, so far, it has been fairly quiet, but it's also quite early. Um, it's usually when you get into late May and June. And sometimes, um, I can tell you, in 2021, it was a fairly quiet year. We had a couple of events early on that year, and then things really picked up in late June, and it was actually an extremely active um, summer. 2021, we had 11 tornadoes in our coverage area that year, tied with 2018 having 11 tornadoes. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of, of a little bit of the, of the numbers across our coverage area and why last year was just an incredibly uh, light, um, uh, severe weather year, uh, for our area, the lightest, like I said, potentially is in as much as in about as about uh, 20 years. So some preparedness websites, um, weather.gov slash Boston, a great site to get um, information, um, uh, the forecast, the enhanced hazardous weather outlook, etc. The Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, they're the ones that issue the severe thunderstorm and tornado watches. Um, uh, for our uh, area. Those are the watches that cover uh, usually multiple states, you know, pretty large coverage area. And it doesn't mean watch out, it's coming. It means that the conditions are favorable and that there could be um, severe thunderstorm or tornadic activity on, on in the time range that it's issued for. It means the conditions are possible. A warning means it's going to be imminent or occurring um, uh, in, in short, in, in a very short time frame. It's right in your county. The warnings are issued by the local forecast office and they cover a much more localized area. Ready.gov is a great preparedness site from FEMA. And then you see the, the, the uh, uh, state emergency management websites, which have great preparedness information, Mass Emergency Management or MEMA, Rhode Island EMA or REMA, and then um, Connecticut um, Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Uh, those websites are great sites for preparedness information. Uh, preparedness infographics are NWS is on Facebook and Twitter at NWS Boston. You can see a number of the, uh, the, the graphics here uh, and how they uh, put out information, warnings, et cetera. We are also on uh, social media at WX1BOX. That is our F FCC amateur radio call sign. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, so please like both NWS Boston and WX1BOX on Facebook and Twitter. On our WX1BOX Twitter, we will share NWS Boston information as we get spotter reports from our amateur radio nets, non-amateur radio, Skywarn reports, etc. We share them out on our social media feeds so folks can see the information, the, the, the actual surface reporting uh, as it comes into us. Um, preparedness information, um, NOAA Weather Radio, that is still a, a great way to gather weather information, particularly at night when you may be asleep and not really monitoring things. Um, you can set up your NOAA Weather Radio alert to alert you for certain forms of severe weather and whether and it could be exactly at your at your location or in an area that's um, um, a little bit of a, a window uh, ahead of your area so that you can gather the latest warning information. Most radios, they have a tone alert as well as a flashing light um, to kind of indicate that there is a, a warning that, that's issued. Certainly, um, there are mo web and mobile apps, many out there, and the wireless emergency alerts that can come in. They've actually done some work on this where they have thresholded that only certain flash flood warnings get um, uh, uh, the WEA alerts. Um, tornado, all tornado warnings get the WEA alerts. Um, and now a new threshold of 80 mile an hour winds and two inch hail or larger around severe thunderstorm warnings. So kind of the, not all severe thunderstorms are created equal. The higher end severe thunderstorms are now covered under wireless emergency alerts. So another uh, way to um, get warning information for your specific area. And then certainly there's other apps from FEMA, the Red Cross, there's radar applications. So. A lot of different ways through web and mobile apps to obtain information. So now let's talk a little bit about the ingredients of a thunderstorm. So certainly you need moisture, instability, and lift. There are a couple days uh, this week, particularly uh, um, uh, mid midweek, where we we had some shower activity and even some isolated thunderstorm activity, but it didn't really get to um, severe levels, and that's because we had some lift and some instability 
and and but fairly limited moisture, and there just wasn't enough there to uh, actually bring everything together um, during the course of, of this week for anything that was um, uh, uh, severe. Um, and, and this is speaking directly about southern New England. Um, but certainly when you get these uh, uh, ingredients together, you need the moisture, the instability, and the lift. The lift is typically a cold front or warm front. And then certainly with instability, it's when you have the cooler air aloft and warmer air at the surface. If it is cool at the surface and warm aloft or just kind of warm across the whole column, you don't get to the level of instability that you need to kind of kick off with the other ingredients um, of the thunderstorm process. So those are the things that we um, are, are looking at uh, in terms of ingredients for, for thunderstorms. Um, I did see a question come up. What I'm going to do here going forward is um, when we get to the break, I will go through and, and answer questions. So just wanted to acknowledge that. So continuing with thunderstorm ingredients on moisture, this is what forms the clouds and precipitation associated with thunderstorms. And it typically comes from the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, and to a lesser extent, the Great Lakes. That's what gives us our, our moisture sources for our area. I talked about instability, that where you have that warm, moist air near the ground and cold air above. That is when you get increasing levels of instability. And the greater the instability, the more favorable conditions are for thunderstorms. So the instability is, is one of those ingredients. And the cooler it is aloft with warmer air at the surface, and that temperature difference is what's going to create greater instability uh, in for our area. And then sources of lift, it's a forcing mechanism that kind of gets those ingredients to come together and form thunderstorms and potentially strong to severe thunderstorms. And a front is the boundary between two air masses. So a warm front replaces cold air with warmer air and a cold front replaces warm air with cold air. So the, the name of the front is what's replacing the air mass that's over your area. So again, a warm front that replaces cooler air that's at your location. Generally speaking, warm fronts provide kind of general areas of precipitation not so much a thunderstorm and severe weather threat, though sometimes they do. Or if the cold front is right kind of uh, near that warm front in proximity, um, that's another scenario where right around that warm front you can get um, um, some severe weather conditions. But it's it's you know a lesser certainly a lesser percentage that you get severe weather with a with a warm front. It's generally more uh, of rain and some embedded thunderstorm type activity is what you typically get. Um, with, with some exceptions uh, based on how the, uh, the front um, is oriented. Um, and, and generally speaking with warm fronts, they have a much gentler slope of replacing the air mass, which is why it is a typically a more, more of a general rainfall embedded thunderstorm type situation with a, with a warm front with some exceptions. Whereas with a cold front, it replace, uh, cold air replaces the warmer air and it has a much steeper slope. So a much more um, forced um, motion um, that you know creates more lift, et cetera, that it is much more typical to get severe weather uh, with, a, with a cold front. Um, you'll also notice that the pressure falls prior to the front arriving and rises after it passes. And again, the, the cold front is cold air replacing that warm air at, at the surface. A dry line is separating moist and dry air masses, uh, typically not really a factor here in southern New England. Certainly something that happens in the plains, um, and, which separates the moist Gulf of Mexico from the desert air in the southwest states to the west. Um, much that it, it's far more common there. I mean, we will sometimes see some dew point drops, um, uh, moisture drops with um, fronts that go by, et cetera, but it's not really a true dry line like they have out in the uh, 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 the plains and, and uh, down through uh, uh, like places like Texas. We certainly do get sea breeze fronts in our area, and, and you can see the sea breeze is basically when air is coming in off of the water um, and can come in an area where the, the water is, is where the wind is actually coming in uh, from the land. It's kind of where those points meet, and sometimes that is a source of lift to get the uh, 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 thunderstorm process going. Um, when we have a land breeze, it's a breeze that's coming off the land toward uh, the water. The sea breeze front is, is, as I said, a source of lift. 
And this is an example here uh, from 2020 uh, where we had um, some activity in the Weymouth area. This was mostly just heavy rain. It wasn't severe. However, this sea breeze front here extended all the way up to Waltham and Weston. And we did get some uh, wind damage in, in, uh, that met the severe limits in the Waltham Weston area from this uh, situation um, uh, back in, in, in 2020. So um, sea breeze fronts definitely common, a common source for um, uh, some level of, of severe weather and thunderstorm development for our area. We can also get cases with orographic lift, particularly in the Berkshires and the Worcester Hills, where the air is forced to rise due to the terrain. And you can see that we can get um, a rain shadow area on the other side of the hills and mountains where one side is getting much heavier rain and that orographic lift is kind of forcing the process to get the thunderstorm activity to occur. So again, another, another source of lift is some of the terrain and, and different elevation that we have in parts of our interior locations. Thunderstorm stages. So we have the cumulus stage and we certainly had some cumulus clouds here over the last few days. They didn't really develop much further than that, except for uh, maybe on Thursday, we did get to the point where we had showers and, and even a few thunderstorms where we hit this mature stage and actually got some thunderstorm activity on an isolated basis. And then we kind of went into a dissipating stage. And this whole cycle, um, it can vary in length depending on the type of thunderstorm. It can be as little as 20 to 30 minutes, or it could go on for several hours depending on the type of of, of situation where you're having that's formulating the thunderstorms and also um, the, the, you know that cycle and how well those thunderstorm ingredients uh, that we've been talking about here come together. So again, the life of the thunderstorm, it's dependent on how much the, the, the how much energy there is, how much uh, heat gets released. And as the heat and energy is released and the rain cools down the entire process, the energy is gone. So you can see that, you know, the, some of it could be motion related. It can be what kind of ingredients that we have and what type of, of thunderstorm activity that we get that kind of, and how much energy is available, et cetera, how, how vertically oriented the storm is that ultimately determines how long the, the thunderstorm uh, lasts. So talking again, the types of, of thunderstorms, we have the single cells, which are the occasional severe threat. Those are the ones that usually are the ones that last 20 to 30 minutes and not much longer than that. As we get into multi-cell clusters and lines, those can start to last um, several hours, as can um, supercells. And as we go through these types of storms, you go from an occasional severe threat uh, with single cells or pulse type storms, which means not you know, more often than not, they do not produce severe weather, but they occasionally do. Then when we get into the multi-cell cl clusters and lines, it's a, the, a, the threat for, greater threat for severe weather um, increases with clusters and lines and certainly a significant severe threat with any supercells. The single cell storms, again, last about a half hour. They're occasionally severe. Usually they're not. Small hail may be reaching up to the severe threshold of hail. Gusty winds may be re reaching the threshold of severe hail and minor flooding because it's not hanging around too long. There may be some brief flooding while it's going on and shortly thereafter, and then it recedes pretty rapidly. And again, you see the cumulus mature and dissipating stage of these single cell or pulse type storms. And you're probably asking yourself, well, what does severe mean? Well, we'll get to that, as I said, in the second part of the program. Single cell storms, you can see right here, this is a single cell storm in the uh, uh, in Hampton County area of Mass. This is what the person is seeing. Hopefully they're using a mounted dashboard cam and they're not doing this and trying to drive at the same time. But they kind of see that the storm is kind of straight up and down and it kind of rains itself out and does so fairly uh, rapidly. Again, could be marginally severe uh, from a, a, a severe uh, weather uh, uh, perspective. Generally speaking, the single cell pulse type storms are not severe. Multi-cell clusters can last one to several hours and they may become severe. A, a better threat for hail, a better threat for strong winds, a better threat for flooding. And you can see here, this is the shelf cloud feature. And under the shelf cloud 
is the potential for the strong to damaging winds. And we're going to talk a lot about this because this is often a misdiagnosed cloud feature that we, we see at times. Um, and, and then after the shelf cloud and the strong and damaging winds comes the rain and the hail and maybe some winds associated uh, with that activity as well. So hail, strong winds, and flooding are a bigger threat when multi-cell clusters, and they can kind of last longer because they, the, these clusters can kind of feed off of each other here. This is an example of um, multi, of the main storm towers of a, of a cluster here. There's, a, there's probably at least three storms kind of clustered together here as they approach the city of Boston. There's also the multi-cell lines, are no, also known as squall lines. And you can see here, this was May 15th, 2020. And some of the strongest activity of squall line was in southern New Hampshire and northeast Mass. Uh, in particular, the Groton, Acton, Westford area was hit very hard um, with damaging winds uh, measured close to 90 miles per hour. Many trees and wires down um, in that area from straight line winds with the squall line. Um, a line of severe thunderstorms with a, a squall line can form along or ahead of a front or boundary, typically a cold front, and they're linear in structure and can be more than 100 miles long and preceded by that shelf cloud, which extends from horizon to horizon, and under the shelf is the strong and damaging winds that we'll be stressing here in the next few, few slides. And this example here in Needham was from May 21st, um, 2006. This is actually a relatively low top squall line, so the storms only went up to maybe a little over 20,000 feet. And just the conditions of that day um, and just allowed these low top storms to become severe. Um, and on the radar, when they were out in Western Mass, they looked like a, just a few showers, but as they got closer to the radar in like Northeast Connecticut through Central Mass, you could see there was clearly a squall line of, of severe weather. So um, again, the, the, the height of the storm and how tall it is to produce severe weather kind of depends on the day. Some days they can be very low topped and some days they can be um, need to be very tall, you know, over the 40 or 50,000 foot range. The multi-cell lines can last hours or even days. They are often severe and most common type that produce severe weather. You see the May 15th, 2020 example on the right. This is the June 9th, 2011 example on the left. Hail, damaging winds and flooding are all threats. This June 9th event was very formidable across southern New England, but um, uh, it was kind of overshadowed because eight days prior to that event, we had had the June 1st tornado outbreak, including the EF3 38 mile long path um, Springfield uh, tornado that went through the region. So, um, you know, the so Storm Prediction Center does convective outlooks at different categories. This was uh, an area, part of the area was under moderate risk for severe weather. And here on May 15th, 2020, there was areas that were in both the enhanced and moderate risk categories. And the enhanced risk of severe weather category was a new category added um, roughly in the mid to late um, 2014 uh, timeframe. So again, talking about the shelf cloud, which we've mentioned a couple times already here, that is the leading edge of the gust front and marks the, the updraft downdraft region of the squall line. Under the shelf is where the strong to damaging winds are and it slopes down and away from the precipitation. Um, it can also sometimes be referred to as the gust front, um, an outflow boundary out of, out of the storms, et cetera. It's an ex example under the shelf is those strong to damaging winds. Shelf clouds stretch from horizon to horizon, and again, attached to the storm base, sloping away from the rain. So oftentimes the, this shelf cloud is, is considered, oh, is this something tornadic? And it isn't. There's a, a weather hazard associated with this, which is the strong um, uh, to damaging winds under the shelf, but it's not an indicator of tornadic activity. And you can see here how this one in Tennessee extends from horizon to horizon. Shelf clouds are pretty ugly. Um, sometimes they can have cloud fragments or what we call scud clouds, and that's the name of the cloud. It's not an acronym because sometimes that's a, a question that's asked. They're just cloud fragments that are part of the, the shelf cloud. They can resemble snow plows or big waves or spaceships. Certainly when you see this type of feature, and you'll see some lightning here. It's time to get off the beach and, and, and time to uh, take cover uh, because the strong damaging winds and then the heavy rain and possibly hail are going to come after that. A shelf cloud of of with the strong and damaging winds. So I've even seen um, where 
you know, kind of the whole storm will have a level of rotation with it. And, and, and you kind of see that on the front edge, but where it's horizon to horizon, the bigger concern is strong and damaging winds uh, under the shelf. Now we'll talk about supercell storms. And part of that will be talking about another critical cloud feature um, that often gets missed, miss, the shelf cloud often gets misdiagnosed for this cloud feature. And we'll kind of talk through that and the key differences. So one of the other thunderstorm ingredients that can also affect how much severe weather we get is wind shear. And when we have the directional wind shear, which you can see here kind of kind of changes with height, um, the direction of the winds, and they're, they're strong winds, and they change direction with height, that's the wind profile that will start to get the rotation process going. Um, whereas if it's all in one direction, maybe less of a tornado and rotation threat, but still a threat for strong and damaging winds because it's speed shear and it's all, but it's all coming out um, uh, in the same direction. Um, so wind shear is another ingredient that with instability, moisture and lift will determine how much severe weather we get and maybe to an extent the type of severe weather, whether it's supercells or um, our, our multi-cell lines, which are more common. With the wind shear, what that does is it can tilt the storm. So we talked about how the rain kind of will uh, will get rid of all of the heat and energy and kind of rain the storm out. Well, when we get the, the, the speed shear or rotational shear, it can kind of get that rainfall to fall ahead of the updraft. The updraft tilts in that sheared environment. That can allow the storms to last longer and become stronger. And that's so the wind shear can help with the process of making the storms last longer. Um, and, and then potentially make them more intense or severe for a longer period of time because of that wind shear. It increases the threat for severe storms and then the better chance for rotation and tornado development, particularly when we have directional, when we have directional, uh, uh, in, in, you know, when we have directional uh, um, uh, uh, rotation in, in the storms. So again, looking at vertical wind profiles, we have the single cell and multi cells, um, unorganized uh, convection, wind shear, and the lack of the wind shear is a can play a role in getting unorganized convection. If the winds are lighter, they're not going to get to the you know as organized. Whereas organized convection, the multi cells, the squall lines, and the supercells, with the stronger wind shear will allow the organized convection to occur more readily. And again, you still have to have the moisture, the lift, and, and the instability with the wind shear for these things to happen. So you almost have to have kind of the right overlap of these conditions uh, for, the, uh, uh, for severe weather potential to occur. So the supercell storms, they can last hours, most likely to become severe, and the least common in the Northeast. And that certainly was the case last year, given we had no tornadoes in our coverage area. So, you know, th there were a few storms that were a close call. We did have a few tornado warnings, and they were supercell oriented. They just didn't produce tornadoes. One in particular was a, a significant microburst of up to 90 mile an hour winds um, in the uh, Warwick, Northfield, Irving, Mass area uh, from last year. But again, no tornadoes last year. So can be rare. Other years, we could have a number of supercells. Um, it just depends on what kind of conditions we get in a given year. And certainly any single location in New England, it, it can be fairly rare that they occur. Large hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes are all threats. We're going to talk about this feature here, the wall cloud, which forms in the updraft, downdraft interface of the storm. And that's what can eventually reproduce the funnel cloud and tornado with the rain and hail out ahead of it. And certainly the overshooting top, which punches through the stable tropopause layer where the anvil is, is an indicator of the storm ingredients coming together for the potential for severe weather. Supercell storms, updrafts can surpass 100 miles per hour. And again, most ideal conditions are when the winds are veering, turning clockwise with height, when they're all kind of in one direction multi-cell line and straight line wind threat is, is higher in those cases. Talked a little bit about this already. You have your main storm tower, then this anvil tropopause layer, which is, you know, the tropopause is usually a stable area. And when you get this overshooting top that punches through the tropopause, that's an indicator of, of storm strength. 
So the top-down view of a supercell, it's that, that updraft, downdraft interface where you can get a, a tornado, forma tornado formation, and this is the Springfield Mass 2011 tornado. And what you're seeing here is not rainfall here, this is debris, an actual debris ball where the tornado is on the ground doing damage, the radar is picking up the, the damage being um, thrusted aloft. Meantime, in the fitzdale Sturbridge area, we're getting ground truth reports from amateur radio and non-amateur radio skyward spotters of hail up to two inch in diameter before the actual tornado uh, goes through that area. The supercell feature, a wall cloud, an abrupt lowering from a rain-free base, and when seen up close, not all wall clouds will exhibit um, rapid upward motion and cyclone, cyclonic rotation, but a number of them certainly do. So not all wall clouds will rotate, and also not all wall clouds will produce tornadoes. This is a classic picture of a wall cloud in Lemonster, Mass. Um, it wasn't exactly a day to get that kind of activity, but this is clearly a wall cloud with the rain pointing to, sloping towards the rain. Um, it's not horizon to horizon. Clear wall cloud signature. Didn't produce a tornado, but certainly it's one of the first stages for tornadic development. And then you can see here the um, actual upward motion and rotation here out in the uh, Midwest, this would eventually go on to produce a tornado. So it's kind of a very critical feature, and it's often confused with the, the shelf cloud, which is why we'll spend more time on the differences. The shelf cloud, it is an outflow feature. It slopes away from the rain. It's associated with a squall line. It's at the leading edge of the storm. And under the shelf is the potential for strong to damaging winds. So from a public safety perspective, with a lot of tents and portable equipment out here, this is a real problem. There could be some safety issues associated with the shelf cloud and the strong to damaging winds under the shelf. Uh, whereas a wall cloud is an inflow feature that slopes towards the rain associated with a supercell. It's at the rear of the storm and it does not extend horizon to horizon. So certainly the possibility of a tornadic threat if it were to continue to develop but it really just depends on the, you know, you know, the conditions, will it actually form, et cetera. Both are a concern from public safety, and it's important to note the difference. We don't report shelf clouds, but we do report the strong and damaging winds of, of a certain criteria and any damage associated with that. And again, we'll talk about that in the second part of the program, whereas the wall cloud, even just the existence of a wall cloud, is something that we'd, re we'd report. So you don't have to be a radar expert if you're trying to figure out, well, what am I looking at here? Is it a shelf cloud? Is it a wall cloud? What is it? Well, we go and look at the, um, we can look at the radar and kind of get an idea of shelf cloud versus wall cloud. You can see here, these are supercells and they all kind of have a hook type of signature associated with them. Not all hook echoes produce tornadoes, but every tornado has a hook echo. So if you're kind of in front of one of these uh, cells here, chances are you're seeing B, the actual, you know, a wall cloud. Whereas let's say you're you're between you're you're past these storms and you see you're, this is approaching you, you're likely to see letter A, the shelf cloud, and under the shelf is the strong to damaging winds. So you can kind of look at the radar, get your bearings on where you're located. If you're not sure what you're looking at, and say, okay, what am I looking at here? Is it a shelf cloud or is it a a wall cloud? So public safety, and I talked about this already a little bit, you know, this is a public safety issue with the strong straight line winds under the shelf as much as this wall cloud in Lincoln, Rhode Island that would eventually go on to produce the EF0 tornado out in Rentham, Mass. So they're both public safety concerns, but clearly here, this is a shelf cloud. I'm not going to necessarily report that I see that shelf cloud, but if I get wind damage um, under that shelf cloud, that's what I'm going to be worried about reporting. Whereas this wall cloud is something I'd, I'd, I'd report in um, as it develops. With a squall line, the upper winds are not the same strength across the entire squall line. Um, the area that kind of surges forward or bows out is the portion of the squall line that could have that will have the highest winds and the greatest potential for damage. It could also be an area where a brief tornado can form within the line. You know, supercells have a much greater uh, potential to produce a tornado, but sometimes with squall lines at that head of the bow echo signature or the place where it surges forward, you know, not only is it the greatest risk for straight line winds, it can sometimes produce a, a, a brief tornado. So this area here the line in this line is stronger than other parts of the line further south. 
Same was true with that May 15th, 2020 squall line. The area that was through Northeast Mass and, and Southern New Hampshire was the much stronger part of the line. The other parts of the line did produce uh, some isolated wind damage, but the area with that 80, 90 mile an hour winds was up in Northeast Mass and Southern New Hampshire. And again, talking about radar and seeing the cloud features and kind of matching them up. So this was a squall line with a bow echo. This inflow notch was surging this part of the line forward. So this was the strongest part of the line. You can also see this emphasized curvature here in the radar. You can kind of see that in the cloud feature here, cloud features here as well. So you can kind of, again, match up where you are. And this part of the squall line was the strongest part of the line. So again, a supercell feature, a funnel cloud, a rotating column of air that is not in contact with the ground. It's when, and as the funnel descends and the water vapor condenses, that's what makes the funnel visible. Can be confused with scud. I mean, if you look here in Stoughton, Mass, May 9th, 2013, you know, this was a, a EF0 tornado that affected Stoughton in this area here. And again, this is an example where I think technology more cameras, more spotters, stronger spotter networks across the country. This quite likely would have not been classified a tornado without the visual evidence and then kind of looking at this area. Uh, it was clearly tornadic. It did some damage to this garage, moved some trailers in different directions, downed a few trees near the garage. This was an, an EF0 tornado from you know a little over 10 years ago. Uh, and again, something that probably wouldn't have been classified as such without that video evidence and technology and more spotters. Tornadoes, a violently rotating column of air in contact with the ground. So you see a number of examples here. This one here in the video is from Wolcott, uh, Connecticut. And you can see this was an EF0 tornado. I think it might have been stronger. You can see, uh, you know, kind of, it seems multi vortex. You can see a vortex on the ground and the debris in the air. It seems like there's a bigger vortex that's just off the ground a bit. Um, uh, this was, an, again, an EF0 tornado out of uh, Walcott, uh, Connecticut. So um, again, tornadoes, violently rotating column of air in contact with the ground. If it's not in contact with the ground, it is a funnel cloud. And tornadoes can cause extensive damage. And you can see here, um, there's the enhanced Vegeta scale from EF0 to EF5 that depicts the different uh, wind ranges for tornadoes um, uh, from the weak to the violent. Um, you can see the different categories. It's based on the damage that occurs, the type of, of, of structures that are damaged, how um, strong those structures are, how strong those trees are in those areas, how healthy, et cetera. All of those things are factors into determining the uh, strength of the tornado. So some tornado damage. This is Andover, Kansas, 2022. So notice some very significant damage. But notice how narrow this path can be. So that's another thing with these tornadoes, even some of the more violent ones, <clears throat> it can be a narrow path of, of destruction. And you can see the debris in the air, but you can see this major building over here is untouched. So it gives you an idea of the narrowness and of the, the path of, of, of these uh, tornadoes and the difference that can make. With tornado formation, we talked about these rolls in the atmosphere and having that rotation and, and then having that lift that kind of picks up these horizontal rolls and then brings them down into that wall cloud, funnel cloud, and tornado, tornado um, type formation in that updraft, downdraft region of the storm. It talks a little bit more about tornado formation. And we do get water spouts. If you remember the Cape Cod tornadoes of July 2019, they were water spouts that came ashore as tornadoes. And those were tornadic water spouts, supercells that formed just like tornadoes over the water with rotation in the storm and winds 65 miles per hour or greater. And that's mostly the ones that we get, whereas we can get some in fair weather or, or, or traditional cold air funnels, water spouts that form over the water water to cloud or cloud to water, they are typically between about 30 to 60 mile per hour winds. And they have, they do occasionally occur, but um, a lot of the ones that we have seen, you know, of, of recent times, they are of the tornadic supercell uh, variety. Microburst and straight line winds, um, obviously a common form of severe weather for our area. Um, it's when we get um, evaporation that cools a parcel of air and becomes heavy and dense. And with um, wind fields aloft or with a lot of very heavy rain in, in, the, in the storm, 
it can then come to the ground and accelerate. And as it goes towards the ground, the winds will spread out in all directions and cause straight line wind damage. So it's a microburst is a strong downward current of air from the thunderstorm associated with intense rain. And they generally last less than five minutes and less than two and a half mile watt, two and a half miles wide, though larger downbursts called macrobursts are greater than two and a half miles wide. So this was damaged from a microburst in Groton, May 15th, 2020. What also can happen with these with some of our severe thunderstorms is they'll produce several microbursts. So they'll kind of look, you know, kind of release the wind and heavy rain and then kind of load up again and then release another burst of, of, of damaging wind with heavy rain. And you can see here, this is a microburst in Groton. This was part of that storm from the Groton Westford Acton area. And you can see all the trees largely pointing in the same direction. A few that don't, but there some of that is sometimes twisted root structures, et cetera, that can cause that. You'll notice that even though we've had these these damaging winds, straight line here, none of these panels were like picked up and blown off or anywhere. So it's kind of an indication that this is a a microburst with that downrush of of air then spreading out um, uh, in all directions. Microbursts are a danger to aviation. They can cause planes to lose altitude quickly. Uh, I don't know if folks watch uh, at Smithsonian Channel air disasters, but they had a few episodes where they talk about how microbursts affected planes um, in, in some of those situations. This was at Bradley Airport um, June 5th, 2010. That was an active period of severe weather, June 5th, June 6th, 2010. We had tornado watches up for the area, and while there were no tornadoes that weekend, we did have a number of microbursts. And in fact, a macroburst occurred in the city of Boston on June 6, 2010. And that really got Boston to think about weather preparedness, thinking, well, if we could get these winds, and it only lasted a few minutes, causing two or three days worth of tree damage to clean up, imagine a hurricane, et cetera. And they really doubled down on weather preparedness um, after uh, uh, the severe weather caused by microbursts and macrobursts um, on that weekend of June 5th, June 6th. So one of the things we're trying to also get folks to understand is situational awareness. If you had a smartphone and saw this storm system coming at you on radar, what would you do and where would you go if you're at the Indianapolis State Fair? Uh, this was a grandstand. There was some question of how well the grandstand was constructed. But um, ahead of these storms, there were strong to damaging straight line winds, and it caused significant problems at the at the state fair. So again, knowing, being aware of what's going on and what could happen, and, and being safe in those situations. And we've kind of given you the basics of what to look for, observe the sky and your surroundings, and be an active spotter. This was a scud cloud that wasn't anything uh, to be uh, worried about. It did get take on more interesting characteristics as it approached the city of Boston. This was cloud to ground uh, lightning um, July 4th, 2012, that briefly evacuated the uh, Esplanade. Being aware of your surroundings, this was in 2017 at the airport. It says Springfield. I actually want to say it was Saint, might be St. Louis, but in um, any event, this was at uh, an airport. And, I, and you'll see folks kind of milling about. You'll start to see them... Um, Moving towards the bathrooms, I don't know if this uh, food place gave out some bad food or something. Uh, but then as we continue through the video, you see the TSA agents heading for the bathroom. And then you see this. So this was a tornado that affected um, uh, this area here. Uh, but um, And the good news was the tower knew what was going on for the planes, but no one told the terminal. And again, I have to check the source here because I originally thought this was St. Louis in 2011. Um, and at that time, the wireless emergency alert and smartphones were a little less uh, widespread than they were, than they certainly are today. So again, heeding those warnings, being aware of your surroundings. So uh, we don't want anyone to put themselves in harm's way for the report. We want people to see where the primary threat is compared to where you are. What direction is the storm moving relative to me? And we've done a few examples of this already, but we're going to do a few more here based on radar and cloud formations here in the next few slides. This brings us back to June 1st, 2011, the Springfield tornado. This person is here, and the tornado is moving from left to right, the supercell moving left to right. And you can see here the tornado, the spotter is in a safe spot because it's moving away from them. 
They can report a tornado is on the ground. It is likely doing damage. They can't say the extent of the damage, but they can clearly see that it's on the ground you know, uh, doing s some kind of damage. They can also see if the tornado were to lift, if it, they could also report that as well and do so safely. This position is a little more problematic. In this case, the person is safe. It's moving left to right. They can say the tornado is on the ground doing damage. They see some debris in the air. So they're able to report that it's a tornado, but sometimes what these supercells will do, well, they will right move or dive southeast. And if it does, it's going to dive right into your position. So this is a case where you have to be very careful and potentially seek, uh, uh, seek um, shelter until it's passed after uh, reporting it that it's on the ground in case it changes direction toward you. In this case, it continued moving from west to east or left to right, not harming the spotter here. This spotter has some obstructions to deal with. He might have had some of that big hail that we talked about in the Fifthdale Sturbridge area. The storm tornado is moving from left to right. It's unlikely they're going to see it unless it changes direction. And they would have to be mindful of that because they're pretty close to it. But um, uh, again, uh, with the in this case, it was moving left to right. They did not um, hit the actual um, uh, tornado or able to see it in this case. This person here is really on the outer edge of the cell. He might have had some rain earlier, and the tornado is unlikely to come this far up in a change of direction and continue moving west to east. So they're not going to be in a position to really see the tornado from where they are up near Warren, Mass. And so this is a, you know an EF3 tornado, 160 mile an hour winds with this tornado, um, quarter to a half mile wide, 38 mile long path but still very narrow. And that's why we need so many spotters to really be able to spot these things. Um, um, some of our other more marginal severe thunderstorms that cause more isolating damage. This is why we need so many spotters to really see what's happening on the ground, particularly in, the, particularly in these severe weather situations, but even in some of our other all hazard localized events, you know, having um, a dense network of spotters is extremely helpful. So with that, we've reached the break here, and what I will do is uh, we'll take about a 10-minute break or so. I think we're making pretty good time. I will take a look at the uh, uh, questions and answer them here first, and then I will step away uh, from the uh, computer. We'll, we'll take, again, a break for about 10 minutes, and then we will uh, restart, and uh, hope everyone is enjoying the uh, program. And like I said, I will go through the questions and then step away for a few minutes, and uh, we will start in about 10 minutes. So. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, we'll uh, be back here shortly.
All right, we'll say uh, welcome back to everybody from our uh, break here. A lot of good questions. I, I went in and answered them all, I think, here. And uh, uh, a few folks had asked, this: the slides themselves individually won't be available, but this recording will be made available and uploaded to our WX1BOX YouTube channel if all works uh, technically correct as it has in the past. We have also have on WX1BOX.org, our website, we have... Um, some of the prior uh, training sessions that we've done virtually recorded and uploaded um, as well, as well as the link to the uh, online quiz. Though in the last slide here, we also will show a link um, to the online quiz as well as a QR code that will get you to the uh, quiz. So I um, wanted to hit that up front as that was a common uh, question um, that we had. Um, the other thing I will mention is um, we do have a... Uh, Skywarn announcement email list. So it's a way for us to push when we're doing Skywarn training, activations, preparedness weather information, etc. And uh, to get on that email list, um, you can email myself by my amateur radio call sign, KD1CY, that's Kilo Delta One Charlie Yankee, dot Rob at gmail.com. So KD1CY dot Rob at gmail.com. And Maybe, uh, uh, so I wanted to mention that here uh, for folks. Uh, uh, so appreciate that. Um, and what I will also do, I see a question on the hills um, uh, and how they affect uh, thunderstorms. Uh, basically, that's the orographic lift component. So it can kind of cause um, you know, further lift on those storms uh, to, and, and, and on the certain side where the storms get lifted by those hills and mounds, they can be stronger in those areas. Since uh, one of the things that can uh, uh, the hills and mountains can do from a terrain perspective that we that we covered uh, earlier. Uh, for questions, you know, kind of will do the same thing as I did um, uh, here. Um, feel free to post them, and what I'll do so I don't distract the presentation is I will answer them all at the uh, end of the uh, presentation, so everybody gets their uh, uh, questions uh, answered. Um, and what I'll also do at the end for those that want to get on the email list is I'll try to flash on my screen the uh, email address uh, uh, to get on to our uh, Skywarn announcement list. So uh, uh, I hope that's uh, helpful uh, for folks. So uh, with that, I will get into the second part of the program here. And if all if spotting were only that easy, right? We we have obstructions, you know. Uh, trees, power lines, you can't be chasing down Route 128, you know, uh, at rush hour. Uh, you know, can even have some animals out there. Uh, here's an example, some obstructions here. Um, and I believe this actually was Lincoln, Rhode Island, 20, uh, uh, from uh, 2015. But regardless, you know, this might be a wall cloud, but hard to tell with the, the trees in the way. The other thing that can happen is our tornadoes can be rain wrapped. That wasn't the case on June 1st, 2011, but certainly was the case for like the Revere tornado of July uh, 28th, 2014, and that was an EF2 tornado. Um, it's common for New England tornadoes to be wrapped in rain. And you can notice here, this is a, a, an example out of Amsterdam, New York, just uh, just over the line in New York State. You know, People are driving into it not knowing there's actual tornado there because it is shrouded by the, the heavy rain. Um, the Great Barrington Tornado of May 1995 was also rain wrapped, despite being um, a strong EF2 to EF3 uh, tornado. Um, uh, nobody saw uh, that uh, tornado in Berkshire County of Mass. So now let's talk about look-alike clouds. These are cloud fragments that briefly resemble funnel clouds or tornadoes that hang low at the base of the parent clouds. These can also be called scud clouds. Again. SCUD is not an acronym. It just means, you know, SCUD clouds are cloud fragments. Um, it's just another way of naming them. So this is, uh, these lookalikes can spawn many false reports. This is an example of a, a SCUD uh, cloud or cloud fragment here. Uh, uh, and, and that's all it is. It's just a cloud fragment. It's hanging a bit low, just, just a, a, a cloud fragment. This is a rain shaft, and we can see rain shafts here often as you're traveling down highways, et cetera. And, and what you note is that there's downward motion here versus upward motion. So that's, you know, it help indicates a rain shaft. We can also get a hail shaft. This is out in uh, Nebraska, but you can sometimes see those here as well. And, and so this is why you, you want to take a minute and, you know, really determine what you're, you're looking at so that we reduce false numbers of reports. 
Another example of cloud fragments here in Wallingford, Connecticut. How about this one here in March 2016? This is actually fog in the valley with cloud fragments and kind of connected up here. But this is just fog and low clouds. There's absolutely nothing on the radar this day that <clears throat> indicated any uh, severe weather. So this is uh, you know, an example of some low clouds and, and cloud fragments here. Uh, Lookalikes, this is London State College, another um, cloud fragment or scud cloud type feature. Um, you know, there was no rotation or anything noted. So another example of a lookalike. And again, we're not trying to show you all these lookalikes to make you gun shy of reporting. It's trying to get you to just think about what are you looking at? You know, maybe take a look at the radar. What is that showing? You know, what, what, what's happening in your, in your given area? So now talking a bit about safety, let's talk about a severe weather plan and tornado safety. So tornado safety indoors, you want to that, use the duck principle, go down to the lowest level under something sturdy, cover your head, keep in shelter until the storm is passed. Have a first aid kit, shoes, and a whistle. You can say, am I really going to need these things here in New England? Well, ask folks on June 1st, 2011. You know, we do get tornadoes, isolated, sometimes significant, usually uh, on the lower end of, of the EF scale. So but just having these things in place and being prepared Will, will, will be helpful in case you ever need to, to use these principles. And, and hopefully you won't have to, but sometimes you do. So again, down to the lowest level. So it'd be like a basement or a, a bathroom, closet, an interior room on your lowest floor, under something sturdy, cover your head, keep in shelter until the storm has passed. Tornado safety in cars. The best thing to do is to find a reinforced shelter if possible. If not, go into a ditch or ravine, or if nothing like that's available, um, lower your head below window level and cover your head. And, you know, some people may have seen, you know, putting your car under an overpass a uh, number of years ago. Problem is, is if a tornado is that close to that overpass, the winds can actually accelerate under that overpass, which can be a, a worse situation for you. So again, reinforce shelter, ditch your ravine, or stay in your car and, and, and buckle yourself up um, and, and, and put yourself below, um, window level for anything that could happen and hit your car and cause uh, uh, debris uh, uh, to happen. This is the problem with tornado safety in cars. Um, you can see this two by four from an EF4 tornado in Cookville, Tennessee, March 3rd, 2020. This uh, piece of, of tree through the hood of a car in Rolling Fork, Mississippi, March 2023. So uh, clearly, um, you know, a car is a very tough place to be for in a tornado. Some people may have seen this in the Austin, Texas area, 2022. The um, uh, truck here that was flipped over and spun around and brought back on its wheels and the person drove away. Clearly not where you want to be in a tornado. I understand that the young person who was very, uh, 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 very shocked by what happened uh, made it to his workplace after the after going through this tornado, and I understand uh, Ford re replaced his truck with a brand new one, but I don't think it was worth it um, to be in this tornado, particularly where he could have had um, a, something worse happen to him. But uh, this is what we talk about in terms of trying to be safe, and he didn't have much of a place to go here uh, in his situation. You know, I don't see a ditch or ravine handy or even a sheltered location. So um, a car is a really tough place to be. Uh, in a tornadic situation. So sheltering guidelines for tornadoes, certainly an interior room on a well-constructed home or building or basement is best. There's some even better options, but it's probably uh, a bit overkill here for New England. The places you want to avoid are the mobile homes, vehicles, underneath that highway overpass. Even like at schools, you know, large open rooms and gymnasiums are not good because those uh, wide span roofs have a tendency to be more easily torn off and ripped up by a tornado. So really it's that interior room, lowest floor of a home or business, basement, et cetera. So lightning safety, um, 19 fatalities in 2022 from lightning, none in Southern New England. They can be treated. If, if a person is struck by lightning, they can be treated without um, any cause for getting an electric shock or anything like that. Lightning is the number two weather related killer when thunder roars go indoors. So. Um, lightning safety here, uh, some examples of ground strikes of, of lightning in this slide. Wind and hail safety, you want to use common sense, know where you are in relation to the storm, stay inside away from windows. So most homes are not built to withstand 
hurricane force winds of 75 miles per hour. The uh, top video here, the, both these pictures are from the same day, August 4th, 2015, where we had two rounds of severe weather. One was in the morning with Rhode Island and Southeast Mass mostly affected and a rogue um, severe thunderstorm up in the North Shore of Mass. This produced many trees and wires down, a lot of wind damage with Rhode Island. The amount of power outages for these severe thunderstorms was higher than Hurricane Sandy. That's how significant this severe weather event was for that area. Whereas in the top video here was two-inch diameter hail in the Boston area, the largest hail ever recorded in the city of Boston since hail records have been kept only those since 1950. Um, and that was in the afternoon. So we had kind of two rounds, one in the Rhode Island southeast mass area in the morning, second round in interior mass and parts of northern uh, Connecticut from basically... Uh, the Connecticut River Valley through the Boston area. And luckily that round of severe weather stayed north of the area that was severely impacted earlier in that day on August 4th. So some examples here on high wind and hail safety. Flooding safety, six inches of swiftly moving water can knock a, an adult off his or her feet and two feet of water can make most cars and trucks float away. Maybe six inches if it's a zip car. Uh, but um, with flooding ahead, turn around, don't drown. Don't try to think you can make it and you may not be sure of the depth of the water best thing to do is av avoid flooded areas hurricane safety any tropical system with a name in the bahamas has the potential to quickly affect new england don't focus on where the eye is going to make landfall it can be major impacts well beyond the eye you know hurricane sandy was a a big example of that be aware of where you are with the respect to the track of the eye you want to run from the water and hide from the wind and be prepared because it's important to be able to be self-sufficient for three plus days. So you can see some of the examples here from uh, Irene and Sandy, which really only affected us as with tropical storm or Sandy tropical storm slash nor'easter type conditions. And certainly nor'easters play a, a big role in our, our weather. And we've had some formidable ones, including um, in southeast New England in, in uh, late October 2021 as an example. So um, I just keep these things in mind. Certainly with the hurricane, the along and to the nor the west of the track, you get the heavier rains and some winds, but less severe than on the right hand of the storm where you're along or east of the center of the hurricane. That's where you get the stronger winds, but less rainfall. And that's because of how the hurricanes um, move up here and start to transition a bit to be um, uh, post-tropical systems. Um, and also the forward speed of the system. On the east side, the forward speed is additive to the winds. On the west side, it actually subtracts a bit for the winds. So uh, that's why the wind and rain hazards vary between the west side and east side of the systems. And also the forward speed um, where they typically accelerate here. That hasn't been the case with some of our systems, but typically have accelerated um, uh, to us makes a makes a difference in how the, the wind fields show themselves. This shows you some of the storm surge from hurricanes. You can see here, this is Hurricane Ian and how this start, the, the surge starts to move up um, into the, uh, the the roadway here. And then what it looked like at, you know, as we got to the peak surge and the peak of Hurricane Ian conditions. So this was some um, um, technology that was put together um, remotely and uh, recorded at, afterwards. And you can see the type of conditions that you can get um, from storm surge. And, you know, we have not seen a landfalling hurricane since Bob in 1991. We've had a number of tropical storm systems and post-tropical and remnant type systems with some fairly significant impacts. But we are, have not had a landfalling hurricane since Bob, August 19th, 1991. Winter safety, although luckily we're coming out of that season, we want folks to be prepared and winterize your home and car disaster kits and know what to do if you're caught outside, drive, you're caught outside, you're driving, hypothermia, frostbite, etc. cetera, um, are things you want to be on guard for and you want to be prepared and, and planned for those situations. So like we talked about, we haven't even talked about the reporting criteria. So what do you report? So what does the weather service consider severe? Thousands of lightning strikes per minute, you know, causing 50 house fires in a single town or city. Well, no, that's not going to be classified as severe. We certainly want to hear about those house fires due to lightning. If people have been hit by lightning, we want to get those reports. But it's not going to prompt a severe thunderstorm warning because a, a thunderstorm with just heavy rain and, and a, can, can have a lot of lightning associated with it as well. 
about 50 inches of rain in an hour. You know, basically an entire city is under five feet of water. Will that be considered severe by weather service definition? No, but please let us know. It could prompt a flash flood warning, a flash flood emergency. We had the flash flood emergency in the Providence area in the fall, in, in the Labor Day weekend time frame of, of September. That prompted flash flood warnings, flash flood emergencies. We wanted to get all the rainfall reports. We wanted to get the reports and pictures of flooding, but it isn't considered a, considered severe or a severe thunderstorm. Um, so we're not trying to reduce the significance of this. It's severe has a specific meaning toward winds greater than or equal to 58 miles per hour, hail greater than or equal to one inch in diameter, tornado or widespread wind damage. That's what severe has a specific meaning towards winds, hail, and tornadic activity. Heavy rainfall that causes major significant flash flooding. We want to hear about it. It's critical. It can prompt flash flood warnings and flash flood emergencies. Severe speaks to wind, hail, and tornado hazards. And with the weather reporting, um, it's the tell principle, the time of the event, the event type, the location of you, and the location of the weather event. At 6 p.m., I observed a wall cloud. I am about five miles south of Boston, looking to my northwest. Um, at 11 a.m., I have trees and wires down on Rockdale Avenue in New Bedford, Mass. I live in New Bedford, Mass. So there's a, a report, um, a, a mock report uh, using the, the uh, uh, tell uh, principle. You certainly want to be more specific than this. Ohio looking up at the sky. Yeah, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. And, um, and again, we want folks to report per the uh, criteria that, that's given. Uh, the three W's of reporting, the type of event that occurred. Hail, you can certainly give us a range of the hail because it's not always the same size, but make sure to report the largest hailstone. Wind, report the highest wind gust. When did the event happen? Was it current? Was it five minutes ago? Where are you located and when did where did it happen? So the what, when, and where are the three W's of reporting. You can see here reporting a tornado. This was re would have been reported at 4.16 p.m. as a wall cloud from June 1st. Here it would be reported as a funnel cloud. And then here, tornado on the ground. And this is where the Springfield tornado was picking up water out of the Connecticut River. Real-time reports are always preferred, but we'll take them any time. I mean, I've had reports come in several hours later and can kind of change the narrative of what happened with a particular severe weather event. So. Very important to give reports um, in real time, but um, we'll take them anytime because you'd be surprised how a report that comes in later it might be a piece to the puzzle to determine whether something was a tornado or straight line winds or something that could have happened earlier, et cetera, that we can, can be improved upon in the warning process. Healthy branches, four inches diameter or larger down. Measured wind gusts of 40 miles per hour or greater. So severe is 58 miles per hour or greater, but we want you to start reporting at 40 miles per hour or greater, especially with severe thunderstorms. Perhaps you may have a wind gust of 42 miles per hour, but you know, two miles away in the other part of town, they might've had 70 to 80 mile an hour gusts. So we wanna have that, that threshold of, it's 58 miles per hour or greater for severe, 40 miles per hour or greater is reportable. Get healthy branches, four inches diameter or larger down, healthy trees down, building damage, power lines down. Again, reports in real time are, are preferred, but again, we'll take them any time because they can help build the historical picture of this event. And you can see here, this was the August 4th, 2015 severe thunderstorms, and this was in uh, West Warwick, Rhode Island. Hail, report P size or larger. Um, you could certainly measure it. When you uh, complete the training and take the quiz and complete the training, you get a Skywarn Spotter ID card that has a handy little ruler on the side that can be used as measurement. It's also good for advertising the Skywarn program. Um, you can use common objects, etc. Please don't use marble size hail because there's different size marbles. By official NWS definition, that's half inch diameter hail. Um, and we set the minimum to P size or about one eighth inch, one quarter inch hail because we had some well-intentioned spotters report sand size hail once. And all right, a few grains of sand, about an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch or, or larger on the hail. And again, we prefer the reports in real time, but we'll take, uh, uh, take them anytime. 
rainfall, two inches or more any time, one inch or more if it occurs in an hour or less. And obviously you need a rain gauge. It can be fancy electronic weather stations, but it can also be the simple $40 cocoa rass rain gauges that are available. Uh, observed river and small stream flooding. Uh, uh, so that's reporting rainfall and flooding. It could be cars floating. A road washout here in the middle here, that's when part of the road is gone. It's, it, it's, uh, it's disappeared from the uh, flooding. Um, whereas versus water, that could be, uh, you know, of, of criteria depth or, you know, you know, a couple feet in depth that's covering over the roadway. And then rivers rise over its banks. This is at the Deerfield River at the Bridge of Flowers on the right-hand side, giving you some examples of, of, of reports of, of flooding. More examples here, street flooding. Um, I work at Dell Technologies. This is one of our facilities in Southboro back when we were EMC Corporation. And a coworker sent me this, and this is a flooded parking lot and some very upset employees in Southboro. Um, and this was criteria that was put in the storm report. Whereas on the right-hand side here, my friend who is the North Shore Amateur Radio Skywarn Coordinator, Jim Palmer, has a couple of inches of standing water in the parking lot. That is not flooding. That could turn into the left-hand side picture and did a number of hours later, um, um, but it was not flooding as it was currently described in this picture here. So six inches or more of water depth across the whole road, or if it's like a highway, uh, interstate highway across a, a, a travel lane is, is what we'd like to hear reported. Roads closed due to flooding, and we talked about which picture. This picture here is flooding. This one is not, but if you see something like this, you can keep an eye on whether it turns into the left-hand uh, side picture here. Reporting during winter storms, we have snow, ice, coastal flooding, ice jams. Um, ice jams um, basically give a brief description. What, how much of the river is blocked? Is it near any bridges or bends? And if, if there's flooding upstream to the jam, if when the jam breaks. You know, relatively rare occurrences, but we have had some reports of ice jam flooding and photos and such given. I can recall one um, on the Ware River and the Ware Mass area uh, where we had reports and, and pictures, et cetera. So gives you some idea on ice jams. Reporting snow, obviously not like this, as you see here. Report when at least two inches has fallen or if you get an inch or more in an hour and especially a final total. Obviously when we get our blizzards, an inch or more an hour can happen for many hours. The key is periodic um, snow reporting in event and that critical final total at the end of the event. Um, you know, for some of our bigger storms and blizzards, um, the disaster declarations are based on spotter reports, public safety, amateur radio reports, etc. General public reports um, don't factor into it because they want folks to not do what, what's being shown here. Um, snow squalls, thunder snow, a quick change from rain to snow or back. In terms of snowfall reporting, you want to find a clear, flat, open area away from trees and buildings and take several measurements around the area. Avoid drifts and bare spots and report the average value. Um, when If you give us a report, five and a quarter inches of snow, we'll round up to the nearest tenth, 5.3 inches. It is not necessary to clear your spot during the storm, but if you do clear the snow, wait six hours between cleanings. Let the snow settle a bit, etc. Don't... Um, because otherwise you're measuring more snowfall rate than accumulation. Obviously, once a storm has passed uh, and another storm is coming, you want to clear the area and have it ready for the next storm system that, that, that is coming. So you're measuring by storm and not contaminating with other snow that might already be on the ground. Ice measuring, we'll try to simplify this as best as we can. This right here is elevated horizontal ice measurement, and what you get from the ruler is what the measurement is, whereas elevated ra radio ice thickness is where you take this value and, um, and, and divide by two to get a, a average value. The best thing to do for us is send us a picture of your measurement. And then and, and tell us what you measured, and then it gives us a really good idea of what's of what's happening with ice measuring. Snow squalls. We want those reports, you know, where you know, and certainly videos and pictures are very helpful here. Any snowfall measurement with the snow squalls, but in particular, 
what kind of accidents or, or incidents can occur. These can these snow squalls can produce chain reaction accidents that result in injuries and deaths. They're similar to blizzard conditions, but very localized and much shorter in dur duration. This is a time lapse video of a snow squall taking over New York City. So you can see it kind of comes through and, and, and the city pretty much disappears under the snow squall. That reduced visibility and then if temperatures are, are marginal and they dip below freezing during the snow squall, it can kind of instantly cause black ice. And between that and the low visibility, it can cause um, those chain reactions, significant bad accidents. I know this past winter season, uh, that was the situation uh, in uh, Pennsylvania uh, with one of these snow squall incidents. Reporting coastal flooding, structural damage, beach erosion, you know, roads closed due to coastal flooding, um, um, similar coastal flooding rules, six inches of water in the roadway and higher. We would want to hear those reports on coastal flooding. And hurricanes, it's all of the above. It's the rainfall measurements, the wind measurements where available, trees down, wires down, structural damage, street flooding, coastal flooding, um, uh, uh, urbanized and street flooding. All of those things are what we want to hear during hurricanes, understanding that safety is number one. We want folks to report accurately because false reports, false warnings can equal no actions and fatalities or injuries. And the, you know, especially here in our coverage area, the media, et cetera, if they see a Skyward Spotter report, they believe it has been through a lot of uh, number of vetting and there's trained folks that look at what they're that know what they're doing in terms of spotting. So take a deep breath, report only what you, you see, not what you think or wanted to see. In terms of what, what you heard someone else saw, there's a number of us in the amateur radio community that are trained to monitor public safety reports and relay that information in. We have a kind of a specialized training for that that we've put some of our folks through or or have they have learned over time or their folks in public safety. Uh, that um, know how to do this properly. So they will send in some of those reports. Um, for others that haven't been through that, just report what you see and you know, not what you think or wanted to see and stay calm because a lot of people are likely listening to what you are saying. Like I said, especially here, the, the Skywarn um, training and such that, that the media and others are aware of, you know, they know folks have been through a level of training. So use that training to report precisely. Flooding do's and don'ts on reporting. On the left-hand side, this is a little bit of standing water, not even covering one travel lane. That is not a flooding report to call in. On the right-hand side, the splash over from the ocean, putting seaweed, debris, and rocks into the roadway, absolutely something we, we want to hear about. On the left-hand side, this looks like some standing water. Maybe that was a flooding issue earlier, but it isn't now. We wouldn't report that on the left-hand side. Mudslide here in Chester, Mass. That is definitely something we want to hear about on, on the right-hand side of the flooding um, uh, pictures here. Wind damage do's and don'ts. Don't want the small twigs and branches when it comes to wind, but tr you know trees uh, you know, or large branches, four inches in diameter or larger down, we do want to hear about. With the smaller twigs, if they are down due to ice, that's a great way to you know, let us know about those small twigs and branches down due to ice. And it's also a good way to report the ice thickness. So keep that in mind. There was a question about this earlier. Report what you see, not what you think you see. Don't worry about if it's a microburst or straight line or even tornadic damage. Uh, just tell us what the damage is. I have several 10 inch diameter trees down due to some strong winds with this passing storm at 11, 10 a.m. on Rockdale Avenue in New Bedford. Uh, you know, that is um, more important to us. We can sort out what kind of damage it is if, the, if it's widespread, more widespread, et cetera, uh, after, the, after the storm uh, has passed. Just give us that, the, you know, through the, the, the W's of reporting, et cetera, the information and what you see. Don't worry about designating it one thing or the other. That will come later. Um, reporting do's and don'ts on clouds. So this is a cloud feature here. Looks funnel shaped. I don't see much rotation or anything though. I, I'll keep an eye on it. We'll monitor it. But I don't see anything here that is indicative of uh, uh, something that I would report or anything severe. It might just be part of the rain area and a cloud fragment. And that's a bird, not debris that, that just flew by here. Reporting do's and don'ts on lightning. Don't report that there's a, light, a lot of lightning. Do be aware of the lightning threat. If there are house fires or damage from lightning uh, 
if there's uh, injuries due to lightning, hopefully not fatalities, but anything like that. Those are things that we want to hear about and can be followed up upon. Lightning is un underrated and is the number two weather-related killer. We've talked about preparedness, websites, social media, web and mobile apps, uh, reporting, the time of the event, the event type, the location of you, the location of the event, and have a plan in place. Gather info about the hazards so you can meet with your family to create, implement, practice, and maintain your plan for the various uh, uh, severe weather hazards uh, that can occur in southern New England. We talked about Facebook and Twitter at NWS Boston. You can like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. You can also like at WX1BOX, which is our amateur radio station call at the uh, Weather Service Boston Norton. We share a bunch of the NWS Boston information, but also share spotter reports uh, as they come in, as our time allows during actual storm-related incidents. And we use that as a mean, the means to communicate with non-amateur radio spotters. And um, oftentimes you'll see um, the weather service say, you know, report into both NWS Boston and at WX1BOX. It just gets that many more eyes on the reports as they come in. You will be given a 1-800 number uh, on your spotter ID card um, that you'll get after you complete and pass the uh, online quiz. Don't call 911 unless it's a major catastrophe or something where somebody could get hurt. We'll talk about that in a minute. Weather.gov slash box slash spotter report form is a great way to report rainfall and snowfall. But if you have storm damage and such, while it can be entered in the form, it's better to kind of call in or put it out on social media to us um, on WX1BOX and NWS Boston, etc. Uh, for those amateur radio operators on WX1BOX.org, we do have a Southern New England Skywarn frequency list. That's the direct link. It can also be gotten off one of the um, um, drop-down menus on the website. We are also on Echolink and IRLP. The Echolink conference is listed here on the slide along with the IRLP node, and you can call for WX1BOX, etc. And um, we try to monitor that during weather uh, events as, as much as we can. Um, for spotter information, there's the Enhanced Hazardous Weather Outlook um, and the Hazards Info under Current Hazards, and also the Skywarn page uh, beneath that as well to get more information in general on Skywarn. So review time. What would we report here? So we'll scan through here, and what this looks like is a, as we continue, it looks like it's horizon to horizon, so it's the shelf cloud. Along the leading edge of the storm, sloping away from the rain, and under the uh, shelf cloud would be the strong and damaging winds. That's what we would expect. And if those winds reach the measurement criteria that we set or cause damage, that's what we, we what we would report in. We would not report necessarily that there's a shelf cloud. What would we report here? So we're driving along. We see this here. Uh, then it kind of uh, goes fast forward here. We see this this fire here. I don't know, it could be fire from a lightning strike, could have been an existing fire before the weather went through, you know, could have been scud cloud. I, I personally like the answer of I don't know, or maybe scud, not sure. Um, I would prefer the answer, I think, I don't know here based on the, the video evidence presented here. What would you report here? Night after heavy rainfall fell in town, you drive up the road and you see this. Would you call the weather service? Absolutely. This was a road washout. And also, if you're able to drive up uh, to this, I would also call um, your local public safety as well. You know, it's, um, it's, the road isn't blocked off. Um, somebody could drive in it. If they're not paying attention, that could be a big problem. So if you were able to drive up to something like this, I would call the weather service and then I would call local public safety to make sure the road gets blocked off. And that was actually advice from some former retired public safety people that were actually in a, a spotter class a number of years ago said, yeah, this would be a case, you know, if you're able to drive up to it, you know, let someone know so that they can block it off. What would you report here? Uh, you wake up in the morning, you see this on the trees. Would you call the weather service? Absolutely. This is a half inch of elevated ice. It's all on one side of the branch here. So it's a pretty straightforward measurement and you would definitely call the weather service here. Cold winter's night, and this is happening in your backyard. Would you call the weather service? Yes, this is coastal splash over a sea wall, causing some minor uh, flooding on the other side of the wall. This is definitely something we'd want um, to hear about uh, for the weather service. Summer vacation on the Cape, and you see this. Would you call the weather service? Yes, this is two water spouts, one of which 
would hit land and flip a lifeguard shack um, on land. So it would also be classified as a tornado. So yes, I would definitely report this to the Weather Service. Is there anything reportable here? Not that I can see. I mean, this looks like just some, as uh, some of so the forecasters like to say at the Weather Service, some scary looking clouds, some low clouds, etc. Nothing really reportable here. So we'll go through this video here, and I'll leave the sound off because it's just music uh, playing. But what we have here is definitely some upward motion and rotation. Definitely looks like we have a funnel cloud here. So we would call in a uh, funnel cloud report here. Uh, we continue to monitor. Still looks like a funnel cloud. Hard to tell if it's on the ground. Um, it's very close to the ground, so I might be willing to say that. But can't really see it because of the trees or obstructions if it is on the ground. So we keep watching it. It may even be on the ground here. Very hard to tell still. Um, but then we see this debris and then we can call in and say, okay, uh, we had a touchdown of this tornado. I saw debris in the air. I can't tell the extent of the damage, but I know it hit the ground there. So there's definitely some damage that um, may need to be investigated uh, later to confirm, you know, the, the extent of damage with this tornado. Um, so this was the Coventry, Connecticut. This was a tornado that was uh, EF0 to EF1 that uh, had a discontinuous path from Coventry, Connecticut to Mansfield, Connecticut. And you can see here, after a time, it did actually dissipate a bit for a time um, in that uh, video. So you would report in the funnel cloud when it touched down, when the debris was in the air, and also when you think it may have, have uh, dissipated at the end of the video. You're driving into the city and you see this, would you call the weather service? Absolutely. This is uh, very significant flooding up to the uh, trunk and hood of a car. And uh, we definitely would want this reported. This was from the remnants of Tropical Storm Lee in Fall River, Mass. And yes, it's an urbanized area with some um, drainage issues, but this is not something we want people uh, to be to drive into. You're driving into the city and you see this. Would you call the weather service? I would. This is, I think, the minimum criteria of large branch damage. They look pretty healthy. I would uh, report um, these downed branches into NWS. In conclusion. Somebody needs to call and say, yeah, there actually is one on the ground. No, it's coming right at us. <laughs> it does look like it's coming right at us. I mean, are we supposed to go to the basement, or should we actually try to vacate? Because, because why would we stand here? Yeah. So, do I don't think it's that big, huh? It looks like it's going to hit the house. So, yes, I definitely report a tornado on the ground. I think it's a little bigger than they might imagine, and then I would obviously take cover, and then, if possible, after taking cover in its past, report the extent of damage from this tornado. This was Munson, Mass., June 1st, 2011. All right, so we want to thank folks for their time uh, this morning. This is the QR code that gets you to the quiz. There's also the link here. It's a, a short link um, here that's on, on screen. I will leave this on screen for a bit. Um, also, I'll mention to you that... Um, this quiz form is on wx1box.org under the uh, training resource section. Uh, we have the link there as well. So if you don't have to feverishly look for this link, but here's the QR code, the link, and it is a direct link off the wx1box.org um, website. So wanted to mention that to folks here. We actually finished a bit early, about 10 minutes early. I am going to take a look at the question panel here uh, for folks. So uh they can uh, see that. I'm going to uh, try and pause the screen here so people can see that while I answer questions and it shouldn't show up and block the uh, question screen, but let me know if it if it does. Um, and I will go through and answer uh, some of the uh, questions here and I will take a pause on mute and folks can um, get the quiz link and QR code uh, uh, while we're while I'm answering the questions here.
All right, I see no more questions. Um, I answered them all here in the uh, question panel chat. I've left the quiz information up here. I also put the link that's on the slide here. It's one of the answers to questions for those uh, with mobile use. Um, I, I think there may be another question here. Some folks have asked about additional information on amateur radio. That was one of the questions that I answered. You can also email me for more information there. We are always looking for more amateur radio operators. Um, um, as another means to communicate um, during storms and can certainly be a, a the, big, the best form of communication when others go down. So a lot of information uh, there that I can uh, share. Um, I think I saw another couple questions here, so we'll, we'll hit those. Um, uh, and oh, thank you all for the great comments on the uh, presentation here. Um, the Weather Service does a fantastic job. We, we, we've had some input into that um, um, here as well. So I appreciate everyone's time. And I noticed as I've been doing the training that the sun has come out here in the south coast. Um, so the sun is breaking out everywhere. So hope everyone enjoys the day. Yes, if you fail the quiz, you can take it as many times as you need to. Um, so no worries uh, there. And as I said, we will post uh, this recording and presentation online, if everything works as I expect it will, uh, uh, post uh, the training. Probably will be up by, by Sunday as it takes some time to get the uploading and processing uh, done here. So um, uh, the, the recording um, and YouTube channel information, um, I can, uh, it's under WX1BOX. And again, if you, uh, if you still have trouble finding it, um, you can shoot me an email and I can get you that information uh, as well. So uh, 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 there was a question on am amateur radio Skywarn self-activation. Um, that's basically when we get a report of uh, Skywarn reportable criteria or uh, uh, a, warning inf a warning is issued um, that could result in Skywarn reportable or severe criteria. We will just bring up a net on amateur radio and monitor social media and other sources for information. We don't wait for a call from the weather service to have us do that. We just bring up our nets, get resources in place to the best of our abilities, knowing we're volunteered to cover the uh, storm situation on amateur radio, social media, et cetera. So that's what self-activation means. And that's a good question, uh, John. So thank you for answering that because we use that a lot in our emails and posts um, uh, on, on severe weather. And many of our activations are kind of that way, um, but when we have certain level of hazards that are very significant and known uh, that are going to happen, that's when we activate our amateur radio station at the Weather Service Office of WX1BOX so that we're assured we have direct communication with the forecasters in case things are bad enough, it can take out some communications or it's a very rapid situation where just being co-located in the building is helpful. We can do a lot remote. We were kind of trending in that direction even before the pandemic, but um, afterwards uh, uh, here, you know, it's gonna be kind of similar that we continue in kind of that fashion for activations. Um, how do you know if you pass the test? I believe at the end of it, it should um, tell you that you've passed. Um, if not, let me know that because we'll work the, with the forecasters to improve that. But um, it should tell you if you've uh, uh, passed uh, at, the, at the end. Um, uh, but let us know if that's, that's not the case. Um, uh, it should give you the score at the end. Yes, that, that's correct. Um, so I'll take a pause here for any other questions. And... Uh, if not, we will wrap it up today. I thank you for spending time with me here in this virtual training for the last couple of hours. As I said, conditions seem to be clearing out a bit more here, especially here in the South Coast. So um, hope everyone can enjoy the day, enjoy the weekend, and happy Mother's Day to those that are uh, out there. So I don't see any more questions. So again, thank you everybody for your time today. Really appreciate it. And uh, hope everyone has a, has a great weekend. And uh, we will catch you on the air at Amateur Radio or over social media, et cetera, with reports during uh, actual uh, severe weather events per our reporting criteria. So thank you all and have a great day.